All right, so I see you guys stayed with me. Uh, we left off last time talking about, we discussed polyplacophora and then the gastropoda in part two of the Mollusca lecture. And we left off with the sea hair circle situation. So there are all sorts of weird and goofy and crazy stories when you start talking about life and nature. Um, explore them. That's the fun part about being a biologist. There's all sorts of things out there that just are <laughs> interesting and make you go, huh, okay. All right, so let's move into our third class of mollusks. This will be the bivalves. So again, let's label this class bivalvia. That is the official class organ or class level this is our clams our mollusks our scallops so when we look at this group we want to look at it and say okay what is different about the bivalves that make them different than the other mollusks and the big key difference here is that these guys have a two-part shell that's what makes a bivalve by meaning two Let's see what kind of grammar i'm supposed to do here okay by means they have two they have a shell that has two parts there's a top part and a bottom part top hinge bottom hinge whatever we want to call it that's what makes them bivalves all right so oysters mussels clams etc uh some other key things to mention about the bivalves let me move to the next slide because i i'm out of room on this one um whether we're talking about the giant clams or the scallops other things that make bivalves different and kind of special when we look across bivalves they will lack the radula so they're not feeding by using a radula to scrape and scratch and eat algae. So instead, what these guys do is they filter feed. So to be a filter feeder, or if you are a filter feeder, you're basically eating anything that comes through the water column. And the way this will work is, let me make this even smaller so I can draw this out. The way this will work is you have your clam, your oyster, scallop, etc. And bear with me on the drawings. You know, they're not good on the board. They're even worse on screen with the mouse. So the way this will work, water enters one side of the bivalve. There's an incurrent siphon. It's actually a little suction tube that pulls water in. The water goes through the animal and then it exits out the other side. And anything in that water, whether it's algae, whether it's little larvae, those little other mollusks, mollusca larvae, etc., as it comes into the animal, it gets filtered and trapped. And they feed upon that. And then the clean water, in a sense, gets pushed out similar to what the sponges were doing. They're filter feeders. They're omnivores because they don't selectively say, nope, I can't eat that because that's animal. I'm only gonna eat algae. It's whatever comes in gets filtered and retained. So again, we call them filter feeders. Uh, the negative here, if there are pollutants in the water, as those come in, those also can get accumulated. So long time ago, earlier in the semester, we talked about a thing called red tide. Remember that event? I want you guys to go look up what organisms contribute to red tide. Those are the things that produce the toxins. The toxins get filtered by the bivalves, trapped within the body of the bivalve. Bivalve then gets harvested and sold at a seafood store in town containing toxins unintentionally but it does happen unfortunately so again that that's kind of a negative um when they're filter feeding it's their gills 
that filter the water. Passing through them, trapping, and the gills filter out oxygen and good nutrients, but it also can pick up uh, the pollutants and the toxins in the water. So again, remember red tide. Actually, let me change it so it's more memorable. Try to get, try to do things here to make you guys remember certain things. All right, okay. Uh, other big things to mention is when these guys are developing and growing the mantle remember that term and that structure the mantle secretes the shell and if an irritant usually a little grain of sand is trapped between the mantle and the shell, this is what will develop into a little thing we call the pearl. So what will happen, if you look down here in the bottom picture, there's three pearls here. One, two, and three. So somehow an irritant got between the mantle, so if there's a mantle, and then here's a layer that will become the shell, the calcium carbonate shell, somehow a grain of sand, debris, something gets lodged in here, then as the shell forms, what it will do is it will ball around that irritant to try to protect the mantle. That way you don't have this abrasion scratching at your mantle. Think about it like a callus in your shoe, or on your toe. If you have a part of the shoe that's rubbing your foot, you build up a callus. That's what pearls are. So they're calcium carbonate, formations that try to decrease irritation on the mantle between the mantle and the shell the largest pearl on record unless it's been broken in the recent years is the pearl of Allah 14 pounds about nine inches ugly but huge that was in a giant clam so not typical not traditional when we look at the uh bivalves. So what people can do, and this is part of how pearls are made today, is they do aquaculture. They will make a line of pearls, or I'm sorry, a line of oysters hanging in the ocean, and they inoculate them. They take each oyster and they embed grains of sand underneath the shell between the shell and the mantle and then they attach them to these ropes dangle them in the water let them live for so many years and then take them harvest them pop out the pearls that's why pearls are cheaper today than they were 50 years ago when the only pearls we could find were natural pearls now what's interesting if you talk about that pearl industry is most of the pearls are white if we go back to the gastropods Remember these guys have a shell, calcium carbonate shell? Gastropods can create pearls. They just haven't caught on as much as the pearls from things like oysters. Uh, in the Caribbean, queen conchs, which are a member of gastropoda, will produce pearls if they have an irritant underneath their shell as well. So, okay, uh, big things to remember. Again, the double shell, they tend to lack a they lack the radula. The foot is mostly used for digging and burrowing. And because of how they filter feed, they are especially sensitive to red tide. Stressing this again, hopefully you're getting the hint there. When it comes to reproduction, by and large, uh, reproduction is external. external fertilization because you have male and female members of oh, members of the bivalves we don't see hermaphroditic hermaphroditic individuals in the bivalves they're males or females all right so that is our third class of mollusca on to number four this is the last class to discuss so class cephalop Poda. Move this down. 
All right. So for those of you SpongeBob fans, Squidward. Now what I want you to be able to do is look at Squidward and tell me what is wrong about Squidward other than that shirt. But what is wrong if we're trying to identify him as a member of Cephalopoda? Um, all right, so big key features here. Cephalopods, whether it's a squid, octopus, nautilus, cuttlefish, etc., the mouth is surrounded by tentacles. Squid have 10. Octopus, octo, eight. So that is how we identify the difference. One of the key ways to identify the difference between a squid and an octopus is simply how many tentacles do they have. Um, when we look at these guys, they are the only mollusk to have a closed circulatory system. Okay, highly active more energy, highly intelligent. These are the smartest invertebrates in the world. When we look at all of the animals that lack a backbone, the invertebrates, mollusca, cephalopoda, primarily the octopus, get that award. All right, so what's really cool here, when we look at their tentacles, the tentacles often have suction cups on them and little teeth. So what will happen is those tentacles will shoot out and they will attach to the prey. So here's our little fish swimming around. He's not going to be happy. So the octopus, the squid, the whatever, hits it with its tentacles. Yes, the drawings are terrible. But then the tentacles suction on with that suction cup, and then they hook in with those little teeth. So that way, if the prey tries to pull away, it rips the flesh of the animal that it's attacking. So these guys are very, very active predators. So let's make sure we mention that. Highly active predators. They are carnivores. They're not going to eat any kind of plant material. All right. Um, when we look at the tentacles, they help grab the prey. They pull the prey back to the jaw. And this is the jaw of a large squid. It is scary sharp. It's almost like the jaw of a hawk or an eagle. The top part of the jaw comes down. The bottom part comes up. And because of the positioning, as this top comes down, it actually creates a slicing action. The bottom comes up, and anything in here will get shredded. Um, so you use all these tentacles, drag the food back to the mouth, shred it up with those jaws. Um, when we look at the blue-ringed octopus, they actually have a neurotoxin, incredibly deadly. If you guys ever watch old films, check out the James Bond film back from, I think that was from the 70s or the 80s, called Octopussy. There's a blue-ringed octopus in there. Deadliest, one of the deadliest animals in the ocean when we talk about the potency of the toxin they produce. Incredibly, incredibly deadly if you're not smart. Um, so octopus, again, smartest animals. most intelligent invertebrate in the world. Check out the video, hopefully the hyperlink still works. They can figure out how to problem solve. They can find food, they can do all sorts of things. Uh, another very cool thing about octopus, they have these chromatophores in their skin. It allows them to change color. So there's a new vid a little video link here, watch it. They, as they move across the reef, their color changes in response to their environment amazing feature of these animals. All right, so those are the mollusca, the most second most diverse group of animals out there.